Good evening, good evening. This is Lynette, and this is the 21st Century Watchman's Channel, and it's about time. It's about time is a one-year chronological Bible study, and we're in the book of Malachi, chapters 1 through 4. We're going to begin and end this book today. Isn't this exciting? Let's get started, shall we? The Oracle of the Word of the Lord to Israel through Malachi. Malachi's name means messenger of God, and it's pretty apropos. I have loved you, says the Lord, but you say, how and in what way have you loved us? So he kind of asks a rhetorical question, and he answers it. That's his style of writing. He's it's like stating the obvious, but he's giving you God's answer. That's his his style. And so this style of, I guess, oration too. So let's just go through it. I just want to make sure you're prepared. So I'll go back to verse 2. I have loved you, says the Lord. But you say, how and in what way have you loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord? Yet I love Jacob, but I have hated Esau, and I have made his mountains a wasteland, and have given his inheritance to the jackals of the wilderness. Remember, Eden was was uh, destroyed, and the, the city and it was not be rebuilt again, that whole country was not rebuilt again we have been beaten down but we will return so he says though though Edom says we have been beaten down but we will return and build up the ruins thus says the Lord of hosts they may build but I will tear down and men will call them the wicked territory the people against whom the Lord is indignant forever your own eyes will see this way and you will say the Lord is great and shall be magnified beyond the border of Israel. That's what we're going to say. So let's talk about a little bit about Esau. You know, Esau married Hittites who were not fans of the Israelites. And they were arch enemies the entire time for the most part. And so for him, and they were idol worshipers as well. So for this man to be hated of the Lord has to do with the fact that he was d practicing idolatry or allowing the, his household to be idolatrous. And that's something that he chose to do. He could have chosen a wife like Jacob did, someone that was within their faith and within their beliefs, but he did not. He went outside of his country and into, for in into foreign um, or entertaining foreign women once again that the Lord didn't like. And here we are again. Just I mean, he, before Solomon, Esau was doing this stuff and God wasn't having it. God wasn't a fan. He was rebellious and, rebellious. and besides that, he had given away his birthright, sold it because he was hungry. He had no discipline. God doesn't like you not to have self-discipline and for you to see the birthright as something so trivial as to sell it for some food. He didn't have his priorities straight. Just throwing this out there. As a son honors his father and a servant his master, then if I am a father, where is my honor? And if I'm a master, where is the fear and respect due me? Says the Lord of hosts to you. O priest who despise my name. But you say, how and in what way have we despised your name? You are presenting defiled food upon my altar. But you say, how have we defiled you? By thinking that the table of the Lord is contemptible and may be despised. When you present the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? So they're not supposed to give God lame animals. They're supposed to pick the best from their um, flocks. And this was give him their best, and they're not doing that. It says, when you present the lame and the sick, is it not evil? Offer such a thing to our your governor. Would he be pleased with you, or would he receive you graciously? Says the Lord of hosts. So if you wouldn't do it for the government, you're going to do this to me? I'm your God who's delivered you and brought you through and healed you, and you're going to do this for me? That's not what's up. But now, will you not entreat God's favor that he may be gracious to us? With such an offering from your hand, 
Will he show favor to any of you, says the Lord of hosts? Oh, that there were even one among you who would shut the gate so that you would not kindle fire on my altar uselessly. I am not pleased with you, says the Lord of hosts, nor will I accept an offering from your hand. From the rising of the sun, even to its setting, my name shall be great among the nations. In every place, incense is going to be offered to my name and a grain offering that is pure for my name shall be great among the nations as the Lord of hosts. So Romans 12, one and two, as it pertains to us now, says, therefore I urge you brothers and sisters in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So it's important that we understand that even though we're not putting something on the altar per se, we're supposed to be offering our bodies up every day, how we deal, what we do up to God daily so that we can be pleasing to him. We're not, we don't want to come to him lame and sick and doing half half stepping that's what we mean by when i'm going to give him this but i'm not going to give him that i'm not you're not going to give him all of you god wants all of us and so is our sacrifice acceptable are we at the altar uselessly as being a part of the royal priesthood we can offer our bodies up these are our sacrifices and is our body up to par are our bodies up to par are we giving him all of us? He's not concerned about how we look, but how much we give, how much we offer up to him. These are just my thoughts. But you profane it when you say the table of the Lord is defiled, and as for his fruit, his food is to be despised. You also say how tiresome this is, and you disdainfully sniff at it, says the Lord of hosts, and you bring what was taken by robbery, and the lame or the sick, this you bring as an offering. Should I receive it with pleasure from your hand? You robbing folks to give to give me an offering and you um, st stealing stuff and then you bringing me sick animals. This is not how we do this. Give me what's yours. Give me what you work for. Give me what I blessed you with. Not all of it. I'm only asking for one. Well, you can't even give me that. But cursed is the swindler who has a male in his flock and vows to offer it, but sacrifices to the Lord a blemish or diseased thing. For I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name is to be feared among the nations. We owe God his respect. And we um, should make sure that we're offering the right thing to him and that we don't end up like Cain did, not giving God his best. And that was Cain's problem. He wanted to give God just any old thing. He didn't necessarily have to be a lamb, but the best of his grain, the best of his fruit, the best. And he didn't do that. Malachi 2. Now, O priest, this commandment is for you. Now we're at the priests, right? If you do not listen and if you do not take it to heart to honor my name, says the Lord of hosts, then I will send the curse upon you and I will curse your blessings. Indeed, I have cursed them already because you are not taking it to heart. Behold, I am going to rebuke your seed, and I will spread the refuse on your face, the refuse from the festival offerings, and you will be taken away with it. Then you will know that I have sent this commandment to you, that my covenant may continue with Levi, says the Lord of hosts. You see these priests here? The Lord wants to bless them, but they're doing such shady stuff. The priests, they're not even disciplined. They're doing wrong things this is after our boy nehemiah malachi is coming here saying that there's even after their city has been rebuilt they are still out here filed in these jerusalem streets what's really good jerusalem the priest he's starting with them starting with the leaders the one that moved back first right no he restored their money um nehemiah did restored their money and the tithes and the offerings to make sure that they were getting paid and this is how they act. My covenant with Levi was one 
of life and peace, and I gave them to him as an object of reverence. So he feared me and stood in reverent awe of my name. True instruction was in Levi's mouth, and injustice was not found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and uprightness, and he turned many from wickedness. That's the job of the priest, the pastor, the, the bishop. We're supposed to be turning, or they are supposed to be turning many from wickedness with the word of, of the Lord. That's supposed to be sharper than any two-edged sword that cuts to the heart of the matter and makes us change and repent. If they're not doing that, then that's a problem. Verse 7, for the lips of the priest should guard and preserve knowledge of my law, and the people should seek instruction from his mouth, for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. But as for you, you have turned from the way, and you have caused many to stumble by your instruction. You have violated the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of hosts. So I have also made you despised and abased before all the people. Just as you are not keeping my ways, but are showing partiality in your administration of the law. So they're not giving it out right, and people are not having it. They don't, they're despising them. They don't want anything to do with the priest. They stop going to church. This is an example of church hurt because these people are out here doing foul things. It didn't start in or the 21st century. It didn't start in the 20th century. This started way back then. This is temple hurt, not necessarily, not necessarily church hurt, but they were dissatisfied with their leaders even back then. Do we not all have one father? Has not one God created us? Why do we deal treacherously with one another, profaning the covenant of our fathers? Judah has been treacherous and an repulsive act has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah has profaned the sanctuary of the Lord, which he loves, and has married the daughter of a foreign God. Come on now. We still doing that. As for the man who does this, may the Lord cut off from the sentence of Jacob to the last man those who do this evil thing, awake and aware, even the one who brings an offering to the Lord of hosts. He's not playing around with the priests at all. We can't be doing these, these foul things. God's tired of it. He's just tired of it. This is another thing you do. You cover the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping and sighing, because the Lord no longer regards regards your offering or accepts it with favor from your hand. But you say, why? Because the Lord has been a witness between you and the wife of your youth, against whom you have dealt treacherously. Oh, they have not done well with the wives either. Yet she is your, ma your marriage companion and the wife of your covenant. But not one has done so who has a remnant of the spirit. See, not one has done so who has a remnant of the spirit. And what did that one do while seeking a godly offspring? Take heed then to your spirit and let no one deal treacherously against the wife of your youth. We need to do right by our spouses. They weren't doing that either. Shady dealings all around. They're committed to the woman on the outside, but not necessarily acting that way. You will see later. For I hate divorce. So we're getting ready. We're divorcing, says the Lord, the God of Israel. And him who covers his garment with wrong and violence, says the Lord of hosts. Therefore, keep watch on your spirit. So we have to guard our hearts. That's what the spirit is. That's what causes us to sin. And, and causes us to repent. We have to guard our spirits. We have to cannot expose ourselves to everything. And we can't be doing and acting every which way, as my mother would say. Therefore, keep a watch on your spirit so that you do not deal treacherously, treacherously with your wife. You have wearied the Lord with your words. The Lord's tired of you. God's tired. When does God ever say this? I'm just tired of you talking. I need you to be quiet. But you say, in what way have we wearied him? In that you say, everyone who deals or who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord and he delights in them. 
or, or by asking, where's the God of justice? When we're asking God, why are you not bothering them? And, you know, they prospering and we're not prospering. That's wearing God. Not He's tired of hearing us complain about what, what the world is doing and what they're getting away with. He wants us to just deal with him and how he deals with us. Stop looking on the outside and seeing them go. Just because he has not punished them, what we can see doesn't mean that there have not been consequences for the actions that they have taken or participated in. Malachi 3, here we go. Behold, I'm going to send my messenger and he will prepare and clear the way before me. Now this is, uh, some say anyway, it's talking about John the Baptist. Others say it's Elijah. But this one, some say for sure that this is John the Baptist. So this is a precursor. This book, which ends the Old Testament, is a precursor. It, it gives us a, um, I guess, an introduction to our boy, John the Baptist. So some say that, what, where was this brought up? Well, this is John the Baptist's you know, introduction right here. He gets his um, introduction to the world before the New Testament begins. It's a 400-year gap in between, but he's spoken about, and here we are, some say. And the Lord whom you seek will come suddenly will suddenly come to his temple, the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he's like a refiner's fire and like launderer's soap, which removes impurities and uncleanness. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver so that they may present to the Lord grain offerings in righteousness. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old and as in ancient years. So when Jesus comes, the offerings will be acceptable. When he comes, he's because he's going to refine them. He's going to refine us. Still saying. Then I will come near you for judgment. I will be a swift witness against sorcerers, against adulterers, against perjurers, and against those who oppress the laborer in his wages and widows and the fatherless and against those who turn away the alien from his right and those who do not fear me. We have to fear him. We have to put some respect on this name. We can't walk around here in these streets wild and like we know what's going to be happening and like we are in control. We are not. God can snap us out just like that. And we act like we have it all together and we are the ones with the power and we don't have any at all. The power that we have is the name that we can call upon and our power is in God. That's all we have at the end of the day. For I am the Lord, I do not change. That is why you, O sons of Jacob, have not come to an end. Because I've loved Jacob. I have not killed you, I've not destroyed you. I have not com completely annihilated you. Because I love Jacob, I made a covenant with him. Yet from the days of your fathers, you have turned away from my statutes and ordinances and have not kept them. Ret return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, how shall we return? They still asking, how shall we return? That, Because that, this is, he's, remember, he's, he presents what's happening and then he gives what they ask and what the Lord is going to answer them once again. But now for a brief moment, the Lord our God has been gracious in leaving us a remnant and giving us a firm place in his sanctuary. And so our God gives light to our eyes and a little relief in our bondage. Though we are slaves, our God has not forsaken us in our bondage. He has shown us kindness in the sight of the kings of Persia. We've got Cyrus and Darius and, and Artaxerxes the first. We've got some, some good ones that 
that were helpful during this time, right? They, Artaxerxes made sure that Nehemiah was able to come and do the uh, rebuilding of the wall and the, and the protection of the city. And Darius did something similar, making sure that they were able to go out and rebuild the wall. And then we had Cyrus who started it all, giving them monies to go and rebuild their city and to be able to practice their religion. And he gave that power to, you know, through men. And this is what we, we got here. And these are the three kings, the three Persian kings. I think it's wonderful, God, these Gentiles. Will a man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. They had not paid the tithes and offerings. And what were the tithes and offerings supposed to be doing? They they were supposed to be paying the priests and keeping them in a livable state. And they weren't taking care of their business. You are cursed with a curse for you are robbing me. This whole nation bring all the tithes into the house the storehouse so that there may be food in my house and test me now in this the lord of hosts if i will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until there is no more room to receive it then i will rebuke the devourer in sex and plagues for your sake and he will not destroy the fruits of the ground nor will your vine in the field drop its grapes before its harvest you won't have to worry about any fruit fall from your tree because you are tithing, says the Lord of hosts. All nations shall call you happy and blessed, for you shall be a land of delight, says the Lord of hosts. Your words have been harsh against me, says the Lord. But you say, what have we spoken against you? You have said it is useless to serve God. That's harsh to the Lord. How can you, we say anything against the Lord? How can we say it's useless? What profit it? Is it if we keep his ordinances and walk around like mourners before the Lord of hosts? What's the point of us serving him? So now we call the arrogant happy and blessed. So we call all the sinners happy and blessed. Evil doers are exalted and prosper. We rush in and, and to see all the wicked people, the ones that are, you know, we want to make sure that we're liking their pages and we're part of their following. We're subscribing to their channels. We, we're blessing the people that are not doing God's will, but we are not going to uh, pay our tithes. We want to be blessed like them. They're not paying tithes, so we shouldn't have to play, pay it either. We have a different standard. Act like it. And when they test God, they escape. This is what they're saying. God's done with that kind of talk. Then those who fear the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord paid attention and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before him of those who feared the Lord and who esteem his name. They will be mine, says the Lord of hosts. On that day when I publicly recognize them and openly declare them to be my own possession, and I will have compassion on them and spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. Then you will again distinguish between the righteous and the wicked, between the one who serves God and the one who does not serve him. You won't know. Your name's going to be written in that Book of Life. For behold, we're Malachi 4 now. For behold, the day is coming, burning like a furnace, and all the arrogant and every evildoer shall be stubble, and the day that is coming shall set them on fire. All right, judgment day is the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. But for you who fear my name, the son of righteousness will rise with healing in its wings and you will go forward and leap joyfully like calves released from the stall. You will trample the wicked for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day that I do this, says the Lord of hosts. Come on now. Remember with thoughtful concern the law of Moses, my servant, the statutes and the ordinances which I commanded him on Mount Horeb to give to all Israel. We got to keep the law. We got to keep the commandments. We got to keep what Paul has written in the New Testament as well. We have to keep God in the forefront of our minds. We've got to follow him with our whole heart. 
Behold, I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and the terrible day of the Lord. This is the second coming. He will return the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers so that I will not come and strike the land with a curse. And there we are. We don't want the land stricken with the curse. Elijah's coming in the second coming. And we are to keep the ordinances of the Lord until that time. He should be first and foremost in our lives. And that's where we stand. Malachi has introduced us to the fact that they had not stopped sinning even after the city was rebuilt. And he's let us know that John the Baptist is, a, is going to be the forerunner for the Messiah. And then he's let us know that in the second coming, Elijah's coming. And that the Lord still has a standard for us. And we have to stop complaining and watch how we're acting. And that we should not be robbing him with our tithes and offerings. We have to keep the ordinances. Keep God first. He will remember us and we will be okay. You know, our names will be written in the book of life. Come on now. We're ending with the Old Testament. If you feel a need to repent and let's get this whole thing together just like I do, like I do, and I've been feeling this way since we started with these prophets, I invite you to say this prayer of repentance with me. And if you have not been saved before and you feel like God is saying something to you about salvation right now, I'm asking you to say this as a prayer of salvation. How about that? Say it along with me. Father, it is written in your word that if I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in my heart that you have raised him from the dead, I shall be saved. Therefore, Father, I confess that Jesus is my Lord. I make him Lord of my life right now. I believe in my heart that you raised Jesus from the dead. I renounce my past life with Satan and close the door to any of his devices. I thank you for forgiving me of all my sin. Jesus is my Lord and I'm a new creation. Old things have passed away. Now all things become new. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you have said this prayer with me, put your name in the chat and we will rejoice with you. And if you said this prayer with me and you don't have a church home in your area or somewhere where you'd like to go, then put your name, your city, and your state in the chat and we will help direct you to a church home in your area that will love on you and help cultivate those gifts God's given you. Because we have members all over the United States. God bless you. And one more thing, if you don't mind, like and share this page and subscribe to our channel. We love you. We appreciate you. And we'd love to have you following us. And remember, it's about time.